Before we delve into episode 5, there's a line from the Faunus World of the Remnant that I just need to rant about for a bit. And yeah, I know, another tirade, but given that episode 5 is an episode devoted to the Faunus, I feel it's appropriate. But if you take a wolf Faunus and a bull Faunus, for example, it's a complete roll of the dice. For all you know, you could be cleaning up your son's shedded snake skin. Yeah, that's not how biology works. When a child is born, it usually inherits the dominant trait from one parent and their recessive traits from the other. So when the dominant trait of the child is from neither parent, the result is that someone ends up calling into Maury Povic to schedule an appearance on his show because someone fucked up somewhere. And even if you want to argue animal genetics, you're still overlooking one major point. Snakes aren't animals. Snakes are reptiles. Two animal faunas creating a reptile faunus is literally impossible in every scenario you put it in. But Tom, you might say, this is a world of magic. If you can believe that things like dust and aura and semblance exist, can you really call bullshit on something as minor as faunus genetics? Um, yeah. I can call bullshit. I am calling bullshit. Because this is science, motherfuckers! Listen, I can accept taking crystals and rubbing them on your cock to shoot out fire to scorch your enemies. I can accept semblance even if I have no fucking understanding of how or why it works, and even ignoring the fact that semblance can't be unique because A, the Schnee family, and B, you're gonna run out of unique semblances really goddamn quick. But there needs to be some basic structure, some fundamental human truths that we can fall back on. Biology isn't something you can just bullshit in however you see fit. The faunas aren't aliens. Yeah, they have animalistic qualities, but they're still people. They still have genes. They still have cells. They're still made up the same way as human beings are, just with some extras thrown in. The basic laws of genes and traits still apply. This is no longer just regular stupidity. This is getting dangerously close to Stephanie Meyer Breaking Dawn level of complete lack of understanding of how the human body functions. Magic doesn't just erase science, no matter how much you want it to. There's suspension of disbelief, and then there's get the fuck out of my face. So Blake and Son arrive in Menagerie, and right away, this is probably the prettiest looking location we've seen, to the point that I don't understand why anyone would ever want to leave. Sure is, uh, crowded, huh? Yes. Oh yeah, that road really looks overcrowded. Oh god, be careful. Man, this really puts New York City into perspective for me. It's not like the desert in Vacuo, son. The wildlife here is more dangerous than most other regions. More dangerous than the fucking Grimm? I'm gonna think of it, what else is there? Because all we've seen in regards to animal life and remnant are Grimm, Faunus, and a fucking Corgi. But this island, this town, will always be a reminder that we're still not equal. That we're still second-class citizens. Honestly, with an island this nice, I'd just say fuck them. Like seriously, how am I supposed to take their dialogue seriously when this is a literal paradise on Earth? Yeah, these people really look fucking miserable to be here, don't they? Fuck the kingdoms, this is gorgeous. Which one's yours? Can you see it from here? It's... that one. Okay, the my animation is awkward, but this is a truly adorable moment. And so is this. Blake? Hi, Mom. Baby girl. Oh. Oh, something I do need to point out though, there is a stair directly behind Sun in this scene, but when he steps backwards, he doesn't descend downwards with the stair. Sun is literally floating on thin air right now. It's funny. Anyway, this scene's pretty generic, nothing to really talk about aside from the fact that Sun is doing his damnedest to out annoy Jean, and I'm sitting here wondering what fucking bizarro world I've stumbled into where that can be allowed to be the case. Suddenly, there's a knock at the door. Darn it, I completely forgot about the meeting. It's just been hard dealing with them lately. Dealing with who? Hmm? The White Fang. You say that the same way someone would say, oh, just the painters. Yes, let's just run out and announce our presence to the organization that you're trying to run away from. Is everything all right? Wait, you guys seriously don't know? The White Fang was at the fall of Beacon. They attacked innocent civilians, and they released Grimm into the school. Is this true? How is this not public knowledge by now? It's been over half a year. Even with the towers down, some word should have gotten out by now. Let me present to you this scenario. 
Vail is a smoking cesspool right now. It underwent the biggest terrorist attack in recorded history. People are probably trying to get away right now, visit family members in other kingdoms, relax their nerves so that they don't encourage Morgrim to show up. And you mean to tell me none of them are saying anything? You mean to tell me regular snail mail doesn't exist in this world? Clearly there are ships powered by electricity and modern technology that can get anywhere in the world within a month's time with people traveling the world on them. Surely somebody would have let something slip. The Veil vale News is reporting that Adam was a part of the attack. That news would have gotten to the public, who then would have spread it around like wildfire. And before you say Menagerie is separate from the kingdoms, I would like to direct your attention back to the overpopulated docks that are loaded with people coming and going off the ships, bringing in supplies to the mainland, all of whom could have easily told the clearly suffering people of this island what the fuck was going on. The White Fang's tactics are admittedly more aggressive since you stepped down as High Leader and became Chieftain of Menagerie. Wait. Wait, wait, wait. Blake's dad was the original leader of the White Fang that stepped down and was replaced by a tyrannical fascist. And he's the current president of Menagerie? Okay. While we're at it, why don't we just go ahead and retcon Blake's entire history? Like, I thought Blake's whole story was that she was some ragtag kid off the streets who joined the White Fang at a young age to protest faunus abuse and promote equality, that she spent her life outside the kingdoms, having to fight to survive. Her parents were, well, not explicitly stated dead, but heavily implied that they were not in the picture anymore. And not only are they alive and well, they're the fucking most powerful faunus family in Menagerie, they knew where Blake was this entire time, and they hold dominion over both the White Fang and the population of an entire island? Like, why the fuck did she keep her family name if her family is literally Faunus royalty? How did nobody make the connection that Blake Belladonna the Faunus was the daughter of Gira Belladonna, the ex-White Fang leader and current president of Menagerie? What if Weiss wasn't an idiot and had actually managed to put two and two together back when she found out Blake was a Faunus? What if Ozpin had figured it out? If she was so hell-bent on staying undercover, why the fuck didn't she use a cover name? Because when she was outed as a Faunus, it shouldn't have taken long, in a logical and reasonable world, for people who were familiar with the history of the White Fang to figure out that they had the daughter of the former head of a terrorist organization in their midst. And here's the thing, I could buy it to an extent, like, I could write you a whole two to three paragraph essay on how and why it could work, but I shouldn't have to. I shouldn't have to bend over backwards to try and make the existing writing work. And neither should you. You're a hardworking citizen. You don't deserve that shit. The writing should be able to stand on its own merits without losers like me tearing it to shit and back to try and find some kind of continuity worth saving. Young man, I'm not sure what you've heard of our organization, but I can assure you we're not nearly as ferocious as the media would have you believe. Ah, I love the creepy voice they're speaking in to try and ease our doubts on the validity of their statements. But you know, sketchiness of the situation aside, this is a really good opportunity to portray the White Fang as an organization that actually has layers to it. Up until now, we've only seen and heard about this radical terrorist group, but the idea of there being different chapters gives them the opportunity to see the more peaceful side of the White Fang, the less radical side more willing to let diplomacy handle things, the foundation that the White Fang was built off of. A chance to show that issues like the White Fang and Faunus rights aren't black and white, but a gray area, with no real solution to a long-lasting problem. It would have been interesting to see the old ideals of peace clashing with the new ideals of violence, internal conflicts, but finally give a good face to at least a portion of this what up till now has been a solely evil faction. Or at least it would have been interesting if they didn't immediately remove all ambiguity by showing these two as clearly being evil. So, shall we inform Brother Adam? We shall. Once again, the writers present a really cool idea, and then they just completely fuck themselves in the ass with it. I was hoping you could help me find someone. <laughs> Why did Salem send the one guy who's about as subtle as a shotgun blast to the face on a top secret mission to find someone? My only guess is that she's really hoping this guy meets some kind of tragic fate on the road. And I guess the only reason she acts surprised here is because she's still not over the trauma of the woman slipping through the evil portal from the night before. Alright, episode 6. What are we dealing with here? Uh, Ruby and the team continuing the path to Haven. Haven is a lot farther away than I thought. Ruby? How long did you think this journey was going to take? Maybe like, uh, two weeks? What?! Okay, fine! Three or something! So now that you're over half a year in, you've realized you made a horrible mistake? 
Well, that's, that's definitely Ruby. Okay, I'm gonna regret this, I'm sure, but let's consult the map for a second. So, here's Vale, and here's Mistral. Patch is this little island off the coast here. So, Orange had to boat it off Patch, but they either boated it straight to Mistral going through Vale, or across through the center of Vale on foot, and then boated it again. We know that the village from the Volume 4 character short took place in Vale because, well, the wiki says so. So we'll assume they took the relatively shorter route. So we'll assume that a good chunk of the journey took place in this trek through Vale. Then they boated it the rest of the way to Mistral, and given the technology, I have to assume the boat trip didn't take long. I mean, we're not relying on wind power here. Now, Haven is somewhere on this map. The show doesn't exactly give a point of reference, but it's presumably right around here where the icon is usually placed. Which means that Orange could be anywhere within this circle. I think. Notice I say assume and presumably a lot because this show has done fuck all to give me a frame of reference. Anyway, they see an abandoned village and- wait, why did you drop the map? Guys? Guys, why did you drop the map? Go back, you still need the guys! So this place is basically Mountain Glen 2.0 except they never finished it. And holy shit, you guys, it's Ren's backstory. We actually have Ren's backstory. Oh my god, they said this day would never come. I don't even mind that Ren probably says more in this one breath than he has in three entire volumes of the show. At least it's fucking something about his character. But why in the hell did it take three and a half years to come up with a backstory that can be summed up as simply as parents were killed by Grim while building a new civilization. I mean, I know the creation of him and Nora were spontaneous as fuck, but come on, by the time Lost was ending season one, we at least knew who everyone was and a bit of what they were about. Come on, let's just get through here. Good idea. Maybe somebody should go back for the map. Cut back to Atlas and, oh, I, I guess we're already doing that concert. Huh. I figured we'd at least maybe see a rehearsal first, but no, just straight into the song. Not sure how I feel about this song either, and once the full version is released, I'm sure I'll have a better idea. Good God Almighty, you two couldn't look any more sinister unless one of you was also stroking a cat. Wait, she only performed a concert with one song? I think they at least have an opening act. Well, anyway, this party is stereotypically rich and stereotypically snooty. We offer Fauna's the exact same wages given to the rest of our mining staff. Their argument's completely invalid right out of the gate. I assume that's because you pay all your workers lower than dirt. I'm just saying, I don't think it's necessarily an issue of Where are you going? Dude, she moved like two inches to the left. Come on now, even Vernon Dursley isn't this much of an asshat. Douchebag alarm going off in three, two, one. It's to raise money. Oh really? For what? You, you dumb motherfucker, there's a fucking sign right there telling you what it's about. How did you not notice that? Also, how would you not have heard about Vale in half a year? I mean, I know the high elite have their heads so far up their asses they can only view the world through their nostrils, but come on, the biggest terrorist event in the last century and this cock Hydra doesn't know about it? I love the fact that Weiss barely gives this guy the time of day. And why should she? He sucks. But really, does it come as any surprise what happened to Vale? If they're so arrogant to think they can get by without proper kingdom defense, then I say good riddance. Don't mean to be rude, ma'am, but wasn't your country responsible for the security of the Vital Festival? around talking about nothing worrying about your hair your money your stupid problems that don't mean anything <laughs> Shit! That is bullshit! She couldn't summon at all last volume, and now she can summon on accident? Kiss my ass! And now here come the influx of comments telling me that she learned how to summon in the half a year between volumes, and... Okay, granted, but this goes into a whole other tirade that I've wanted to bitch about for a very long time. So I keep seeing people praising how much Weiss has grown, fighting back against her father, no longer being racist towards the Faunus, not being as antagonistic towards her teammates, and can now summon flawlessly, all showing how far she's come as a character. I... wanna say yes? Because she's clearly a different character than how she started? But at the same time... When you constantly only show the beginning of her arc, and the end of her arc, and you don't really show any of the in-between, it's really kind of hard to pinpoint just how far she's come. Because she didn't really have any shown progress. She didn't learn to overcome her prejudice, she just kind of stopped being racist immediately. She didn't learn to be more tolerant, she just kind of stopped being bitchy in favor of being the butt of everyone's jokes. She didn't overcome her handicap of summoning, she just magically started summoning. There's no string connecting the beginning and end of her arcs. Like this scene at the docks in Volume 1? This should have been the beginning of her arc to get better towards the Faunus. This shouldn't have been the end of her arc. 
Volume 3 was setting up a story for that went two episodes and then it just magically got resolved at the end. Like, when you show character progression, you have to actually, you know, show character progression. You can't just cut to when they're better, you have to show them actually trying to get better. They don't do this with Weiss. And the only reason I can think of for this, and not so much for the other three, is that the writers hate writing Weiss. Her character went from being this antagonistic but still vulnerable heiress trying to find her own way while overcoming racial prejudice, to just being the butt monkey for the jokes of the team and also for being nothing but an object of lust for Jean fucking Arc, a character who, were it not for Felix, would be the sole focal point of all of my hatred towards characters voiced by Luna. And you can't even make the excuse that I just don't like Weiss, because of the four Ruby girls, Weiss is easily my favorite. In fact, of the show, she's the one I keep coming back to. And most of that has to do with how she was portrayed in Volume 1. She was a Sundere from a rich family who would one day take over the company from her father, suffering clear signs of abuse represented by her family. And and as later revealed by her family's history with the White Fang. She's bossy, she's a bit of a brat, and she's self-centered. She's also probably the one who is most likely to think things through before rushing in as opposed to her teammates. Like, she gives reasons for why she dislikes things, and more often than not I find myself agreeing with her assessments, or at the very least understanding how her reasoning got that way. This was the character they set up in Volume 1, and I wanted to see how she developed. And unfortunately, the writers have not handled her with the grace she deserves, as her storylines have more or less been abandoned in favor of either barely and or inconsistently writing Blake and Yang, or spending an ungodly amount of time on Jean. In the hands of a better writer, Weiss could have been one of the deepest characters of the show. Now, she may get a good moment here or there, but there's nothing really defining for her character to stand on. And that makes me really sad. Arrest her! It's her party. She can set a bore on someone if she wants to. She should be locked up! She's the only one making sense around here. Somehow, Ironwood became a cooler character by walking out of the Beacon incident with enough egg on his face to start his own diner. Oh god, she's about to get beat with a belt, isn't she? Thankfully, we cut back to Team Orange before we see that. But now the real nightmare starts as Tyrion has found them and... <laughs> oh, oh, oh god. Oh god, what is that movement animation? <laughs> Okay, well this fight actually isn't all that bad, it's fast paced, it's got good flow, and that flow just came to a grinding screeching halt. I will never for the life of me understand the decision to make what was a good flowing fight and grind it to a halt like this with this absurdly long pause. Who thought this was okay? Like seriously, what fucking animating genius thought this was an acceptable decision? Who I am matters not to you. Or you. Or... well... You do interest me. Oh, gag me with a fucking spoon, please. And naturally, I have been completely taken out of this fight, and no attempts here on in can really get me back into it. It's decent, but, like, honestly, my attention was lost at that point. <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> He's... a faunus. Huh. Well, I, I guess the tail explains why he was sitting like that. Well, wait, no, look, he doesn't have the tail in the first episode. So, where did the tail come from? Is it retractable? Because scorpion tails aren't retractable. Was he hiding it under that belt of his? Well, that means the tail would be located in the base of his spine, but... Why? That's really a precarious place. Wait, does that mean he has two anuses? Because the scorpion's anus is in its tail, so... I mean, it must. Blake canonically has four ears, so by that logic, Tyrion must have t Oh god. Oh god. This conversation went down a dark path. Why you do this, Ruby? Why? Good job in the save, Crow. Now turn around. No, really, turn around. He's going to attack you. You're leaving yourself wide. Oh, wait. He's just going to patiently wait for you to turn around and confront him. You know. Like an idiot. A true huntsman has entered the fray. Why does Tyrion keep getting more Shakespearean with his dialogue? Huh. Tyrion Shakespearean. I'm a poet, and I was not even aware of this fact. You took the words right out. <laughs> now this fight. This fight is more like it. This is equivalent to the Crow and Winter fight last volume, except with this one, I'm not questioning what the point is. I enjoyed this fight so much that it gives me just a little renewed faith that the animation team can get their shit together and actually animate a decent action scene. They move faster and hit harder than just about any of the main characters do, and you feel the tension behind it. It also just showcases even more that Crow is a badass. 
Look at this. No weapon? No problem. Just deck him in the fucking nose. That's awesome. Now that said, it's not a perfect fight. This bit stands out to me. Hit him. Take him out. He, he has his back to you. Just, just go. Do it. No, not now. Now you just fucked up. God, what the fuck was that? Also, the fact that Ruby keeps getting involved. Dude, you are so not well equipped to handle this fight. I mean, shit, a year ago you were having trouble taking this guy on. A guy who, let's be perfectly honest here, was never really all that intimidating to fight. Also, that scythe swoosh was entirely unnecessary. You bitch! Oh, dude, Tyrion, relax. The tail will grow back. I mean, not the, the not the stinger. That's gone. So your 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 venom weapon has essentially been rendered completely inert. I would say he's also lost the ability to shit. But again, two anuses. Uncle Crow, what's going on? <sighs> what's your favorite fairy tale? You mean to tell me that after everything that happened at Beacon, you didn't think to clue them in onto the whole seasonal maiden thing? Like really? After dropping that massive plot bomb on the whole Silver Eyed Warriors, you didn't think maybe we should tell my niece, who I'm kind of hinting should go after the villains to Haven, maybe I should tell her exactly what was going on with Cinder's faction in the first three volumes? No? I didn't think to cross your mind? Okay. Alright, but I just... I just have one question. Just one question. How did they think Pyrrha died? Like, what do they imagine her death was for? Why do they think she charged up that tower on her own to certain doom that night? What does Jean think happened that night? I mean, he saw Cinder shoot Amber, he saw the failed aura transfer. In the half a year or so since then, did he never wonder what all that was for? Or was he too wrapped up in his own grief and inadequacy that he never thought to ask around? I just... <sighs> so many of Ruby's problems, both in the show and behind the scenes, could easily be solved if people just fucking communicated with each other. Just talk, motherfuckers!